listening to President Trump on the other side, watching Kim Jong-un and watching a possible missile launch maybe as early tomorrow of an ICBM. Again, that could come at Saturday Korean time, and it could be a flatter trajectory launch that would put it deeper into the Pacific, more threatening to the United States. But it could come earlier, or it could come later, or maybe next month. That's the hitch with Kim Jong-un. You're never too sure what he's going to do, because he likes to keep his neighbors, the world, guessing and on high alert. Here in South Korea, the military at least seems to be on wartime footing. The South Korean forces wrapping up exercises that we've been tracking all this week following last weekend's nuclear test by North Korea. There are more, we are told, next week involving the U.S. Marines. Finally, a protest in Seoul here, blasting Kim Jong-un, appearing to praise President Trump. Uh, the president's strong rhetoric unsettles some here, but others like it precisely because it unsettles the North. Take a listen. The sound of this uh, sort of vulgar, um, you know, sticking it to the North Koreans, um, they kind of like that because they know that the North Koreans pay attention to this. They're trying to figure this out, and that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. The hitch, according to analyst Breen, however, is if President Trump a year from now or two years from now is still threatening military action. The words might lose a little bit of their punch, according to Breen. Almost every other day, 59-year-old Jing Zhaohua comes to wash clothes in the water of the Yalu River across from the DPRK. She and her family live right behind the river in Hekou village which is about an hour's car ride from the border city of Dandong, northeast China's Liaoning province. She says when she first arrived 30 years ago, villagers were more than curious about the other side of the river. Especially in the wintertime when the river water is frozen, some will go across the border to see the DPRK, and they immediately got arrested and even detained for half a month before being sent back to Dandong. Their relatives had to pay a fine of a couple hundred yuan to get them back. Jin herself has never once taken the risk to cross the boundary. As in her words, she and her husband don't want any trouble. Her son-in-law, however, who shies away from the camera, has actually gone there to smuggle in rice and oil. <laughs> now the entire family runs a peach business a much safer choice for them. Like every other neighbor in the village, planting, picking and packaging is the theme of the day. We've been doing it for 30 years. From late August to mid-September is peach season. My sons-in-law get up at 5.20 in the morning, going up in the mountains to pick the peaches we planted. But that simple and peaceful lifestyle could at any moment be disrupted by the ongoing tensions, which involve the family's biggest and perhaps the most dangerous neighbor, the DPRK. I literally saw the nuclear reactors when the DPRK detonated its first hydrogen bound. They were right in Shimizu County, which is not far from here. To be honest with you, our family is ready to move any second if a war breaks out, and that would not be good. As far as I understand, the Chinese government is uh, making a quite a clear message to the Kim Jong-un regime that the Kim Jong-un regime also need to restrain its you know, provocative you know, behaviors and to create a kind of dialogue you know, environment. I think that that is the clear message. You know, there are reports from the ROK that there could be another missile test, DPRK missile test this weekend. Right. Sanctions, I know that you have said, are not the answer. But with what has happened over the past few months, is there anything that can slow down this pace? That's a tough question. I mean, the, everybody is trying to think about the solution, right, how to slow down or even freezing the North Korean nuclear and missile program at the moment. Uh, I think uh, one important thing we have to think about is, ironically, uh, Russian President Putin uh, made a quite clear statement at BRICS, you know, meeting in China and the summit meeting with the South Korean President Moon Jae-in this week. 
he said that until North Korean regime feels safe, North Korean regime will continue. Even they eat grass. He emphasized that. To a certain degree, how to make North Korean regime feel, you know, relatively safe from the invasion from the United States or allied forces from South and United States, something like that. So the thing is that how to persuade North Korean regime and feel safe in dealing with the United States, I think that, that seems to be quite critical. It almost seems like the neighboring countries who want to have dialogue with the DPRK should right. talk to the United States and sort of talk to them about how to react to all this. Right. The thing is that uh, right now, United States doesn't want any kind of talk because there's a quite clear precondition for talk or any negotiation or diplomatic you know, uh, relationship uh, because United States made clear that uh, North Korean regime first give up the nuclear or missile development program and then promising the dismantling the you know, nuclear program uh, by the North Korean regime. But I think that's very tough uh, precondition because, as we know well, North Korean regime made it quite clear uh, it's going to uh, develop a nuclear and missile program. And then U.S., I mean, North Korean constitution also made it clear that the North Korean regime will be a nuclear-armed, you know, strong country in the future. So how to uh, get out of this kind of, you know, chicken game situation uh, then made tough. And I think that whether it's informal or official or unofficial, high level, some kind of more communication among all these countries will be essential to uh, alleviate you know, current tension. The DPRK's latest nuclear test just days ago was felt in China. And there's concern in Chinese cities along the border for safety also economic concerns and each of these tests really impact China not just politically right. but right. personally so could the DPRK ever cross a red line with China that's also a tough question but I think uh, that decision whether the North Korean regime crossed the red line or not may be decided by the 19th you know, National Congress scheduled in October 18th you know, next month uh, the 19th National Congress in China is a very important turning point probably in defining uh, China and North Korea relationship because, as you know well, out of those seven standing uh, Politburo members, except you know, President Xi, Xi Jinping, and then Prime Minister uh, Li Keqiang, all other five members will be replaced, and uh, 25 uh, Politburo members will be replaced by relatively younger leaders. And then those younger leaders in China, they seem to have a different perspective in defining, uh, you know, China and DPLK relationship. And I think uh, after the 19th National Congress in China, and that those leaders in China will make it quite clear how to deal with North Korea, and then whether the North Korean regime is crossing the red line or not, and then that'll be quite clear after that. That's my, that's my guess. All right. Professor Ross, a very direction to you. When we are leading up to the meeting between President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping later this year, is the DPRK issue going to be a plus in terms of cooperation or minus between the two countries? Well, I think there are certain, certainly limits to our ability to cooperate. Our perspectives are very different. The United States, for the first time, is now exposed to North Korean missiles and nuclear warheads that could reach the United States. And from China's perspective, the issue remains the same. Stability on its northern border constrains China's ability to put pressure on North Korea and to meet U.S. expectations. I don't think that will change. I think, to, to a large extent, the United States is going to have to come to terms with a nuclear North Korea understand the limits of American diplomacy mm. and move toward a different policy which includes negotiations and perhaps some economic contacts. Well, of course, that takes a lot of time, uh, given the current circumstances. Mr. Da, what that is will take your... a lot of time. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Professor. Well, the, the problem for the United States is that the whole region is watching. We've had a 30-year policy of pressure on North Korea, coercion on North Korea, so as you suggest, the 
timing of American ability to alter its policy, it will be an extended process so we don't concern our allies and, and undermine Amer confidence in America's position in Northeast Asia. All right. Mr. Da, you heard your counterpart's words over there. Mm -hmm. uh, so will this North Korea issue help China and U.S. get closer toward one another through cooperation to deal with it? Or actually create even bigger mistrust? I think, you know, it depends on, um, on the one hand, it depends on how far China is willing to go. On the other hand, uh, what kind of action the Trump administration will take in the next few months. Explain, yeah. please. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because, you know, of course, now the, U the U.S. is proposed new sanction in the, U in the U.N., uh, which could be very harsh, like cut the trade, cut the oil supply. Uh, I doubt that China will, will agree to do that. But uh, again, it depends on how far China wants to go. At the, at the same time, we don't know what Trump administration can, can do in the next few, few, few months. Like, you know, uh, if they uh, what want to press they all military, military pressure mm -hmm. or even kind of military conflicts. So if Trump administration, you know, do not want to do a lot, just continue current trajectory, I think U.S. and China probably can avoid, you know, potential conflicts there. But I agree with Professor Ross that uh, we, we could have some kind of limited cooperation. Yeah, but it's limited. Mm -hmm. As you said, Trump tweeted really earlier that he's considering, quote, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. Of course, he's trying to referring to some of those countries and people know that includes China. But Professor Ross, of course, many people run laugh it off, especially experts like you. 650 billion U.S. dollars bilateral trade, that is only direct. Two million U.S. jobs as a result of this, not to mention many of the interlinked trade through other countries between China and United States. This is not something that you could stop overnight. Mr. Trump, as a business person, will understand that, but we also understand his personality. So, by the way, so what about this? Will trade be able to at this point, calm people down, you know, because this point, uh, very exaggerated point being made by the U.S. president, and now people are saying that is not going to happen. Will <clears> this <throat> calm people down, or actually we're going to expect something more rhetoric coming from the Trump administration without real action? What would that mean eventually if they do that? Well, I think Dawei is correct that China's ability to impose oil sanctions on North Korea are very limited because it could well undermine the regime and cause instability. And for a country on China's borders with nuclear weapons, that's unacceptable. On the other hand, the United States would like to see that for our concern about instability is far less than China's. So should America try and use economic sanctions against countries that trade with China, I think that would be very difficult for the relationship at least in part because we could expect China to retaliate. And of course, it's a, this is a mutually dependent relationship. As you suggest, American jobs are dependent on exports to China. And so that may well constrain the United States if President Trump listens to his advisors, listens to members of Congress, listens mm -hmm. to the industry, who understand that American economic leverage over China is quite limited. And so I would hope that that would constrain the direction toward protectionism and trade conflict. But as you also suggest, President Trump is highly unpredictable, highly uncertain. He acts on impulse, mm. and that uncertainty gives us pause. You know, trade is only one thing. Uh, let's just say if the collateral damage is being done between China and the United States as a result of the DPRK issue. Another thing, Mr. Da, is the trust, or rather lack of trust, between China and the United States as an expert on this for decades, you know this very well. These trusts, and now with the THAAD, four more launchers being implemented. Some say this conspiracy theory is actually coming into reality. That is, U.S. is looking at this possibility mm -hmm. on the Korean Peninsula, trying to contain China's nuclear capability as a result. What do you say? I think, you know, uh, of course, I, I don't like conspiracy theory, but the problem here is, you know, if the DPRK nuclear issue go along the go along the way and go deteriorate, 
and uh, no major power can stop that. I think probably the U.S. and China will step into this kind of very difficult situation of distrust. I mean, when North Korea, when DPRK increased their nuclear capability, probably the U.S. and South Korea and Japan will strengthen their military uh, capability to deter North Korea. Well, this kind of uh, you know, policy change, of course, will increase strategic, uh, strategic pressure on China. Then China have to take some countermeasure. So then we will step into kind of security dilemma uh, between China and uh, the U.S. and its alliance. That will, of course, you know, damage the now the weak strategic trust, already very weak strategic trust right. between U.S. and China. And that also depends on the U.S. capability, if there's a willingness to do that, to, to detail, uh, rather to rein back the kinds of desire among the U.S. allies in the region to do further arms race, for example, about nuclear weapons. Professor Ross, do you think Washington right now has that capability? Well, uh, first of all, um, the fat issue is, of course, very difficult in Northeast Asia. And China's ability bilaterally to persuade the United States to change its policy is limited. But I think we all understand that President Kim of South Korea came in wanting to change South Korea's policy and put a stop to the deployment of THAAD. Unfortunately for China and for South Korean leadership, North Korea has made that impossible. The domestic public opinion in North Korea, the heightened threat perception, excuse me, the public opinion in South Korea, uh -huh. heightened threat perception in South Korea has compelled South Korea to cooperate more on THAAD. So North Korea has undermined China's interests and indeed undermined South Korean interests. But going forward, um, the China's ability to contend with THAAD, to offset THAAD, is really quite easy. I think most Americans understand that THAAD is a limited system. It's not very effective against a country such as China, which can build many more missiles than the United States can build missile defense. And the defenses against that are, are really quite numerous. Right. The unfortunate thing is, as you suggest, it breeds mistrust because it suggests America is trying to contain China. And of course, that's not good for the relationship. Right. When you look at this, uh, Mr. Da, there seems to be a pattern already. You know, since the last meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Donald Trump in the United States. We see several rounds of tensions as a result of further tests, hydrogen bomb, nuclear bomb, you know, ICBM from North Korea. Every time there is a pattern, the pattern is, if, if I'm wrong, correct me, sir, that is the U.S. will come out with some kind of rhetoric saying China is not doing anything sometimes, not referring to China directly, <clears throat> but certainly we know who it is referring to. And then we are going to do this and that. And then China will have the Chinese state leader to call DP, uh, the United States, calm down the situation, explain further. Chinese foreign minister working very hard in this regard, according to the U.S. counterparts as well. And then things will calm down for a while until the next round happen. We see recently as well. So, Mr. Da, once again, given the current circumstances, how well are we going to see the role, the leading up, to the two leaders meeting later this year? I think in terms of the meeting, I think uh, the DPRK issue, the nuclear issue, it still will still be a, you know, a key uh, priority of the summit. But of course, I don't think that summit can solve the problem uh, because I don't think China have the instrument, have the policy tool to change the basic U.S. Uh, policy to DPRK. And at the same time, I don't think China is capable to change the North Korea's policy fundamentally. So China can be a mediator, but if uh, DPRK and uh, the United States uh, do not change their policies, I think, uh, you know, what, what China can do is very limited. Mm. And now in Shanghai, we're also joined by Mr. Huang Renwei, the Vice President of the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Welcome, sir, Mr. Huang, to our program. I know you have been waiting for a long time yes. uh, in order to get the uh, technical details ready. Thank you so much, sir, for waiting. But let me ask you very directly, DPRK issue, is it going to be helpful to, for U.S. and China leading up to the meeting, or it is going to further divide us? Your take. Yes, I think the nuclear 
of TPRK issue is very, very serious now. And China should prepare for the worst situation. But we are striving for better. Uh, I don't think U.S. can get rid of China to solve this kind of difficult issue. So China and U.S. need to cooperate, coordinate towards each other. And the time is so limited. Maybe the crisis will happen again. So I think the crisis control is most what most important matter but, we should do. But sir, do. Mr. Wang, you know.